conditions were not exactly first class in the 1950s. In locker rooms like this one, pro football players prepared themselves for games that were like atomic wars. There were no winners, only survivors. Hi, I'm Chuck Benarek, and I played for the Philadelphia Eagles in the 1950s, years that were called the golden age of pro football. Pros like myself played football, not for money or glory, but for the simplest reason, the love of the game. The fabulous 50s, the Eisenhower years. A period when people took life and each other a little less seriously. A decade where the vision of America was tinted with optimism. Nowhere was this image clearer than in pro football. It was heroic, romantic, and nostalgic. The purest form of sport. Pro football became the new national obsession and burst into full flower in the 50s. For nostalgia buffs, the 50s meant fire wagon football, a merry-go-round of big plays, a circus of carefree and colorful performers. It was filled with magic moments and magical players. One half of pro football's all-time team played in this decade. Pro football in the 50s was not stylized or synchronized, but a wild game. A highlight film with all the penalties and mistakes left in. At the top, pro football bubbled like soda pop, effervescent and sweet. But beneath the surface, the game had a harsh, bitter taste. It was a rough, violent, often brutal sport. And you get into that sort of a cannibalistic feeling. All you want to do is go out there and, like I say, you just want to kill somebody. When I get him, I'm going to kill him. Not mean you are, you're going to put him in the ground after, but you just want to kill a guy, boy. You, you, you actually froth from the mouth and you're going to really put it to him. In the 50s, the meek did not inherit this turf. There were bitter rivalries between teams and fierce grudges between players. One that fested for years concerned the Rams' Deacon Dan Towler and the Colts' Art Donna. I said, let's get Deacon Dan. That was our time. He said, fine. So here comes the, the Rams out of huddle. Van Vakken was a quarterback. He hands fake hand off to Deacon Dan. He comes into the line. They pitch the ball out to a halfback. And Finn and I got Deacon Dan down on the ground. We're really going at him. So the official grabs us. He says, if you guys do that again, it's going to cost you 100 bucks. I'm going to throw you out of the game. We didn't know the Deacon Dan, he ran off the field. And they put the other fullback in named Tank Younger. And they both look alike. Uh, they were six foot three, 240 pounds. They're both black. So unless you knew the number, you didn't know who the hell they were. Same play again. We got him down on the ground. Now, I got his nose, and I'm trying to pull his nose off his face. And Finn's finish banging on the back of the neck. So all of a sudden, from underneath the park comes, hey, he says, leave me go. He says, this ain't the Deak, it's the Tank. We had the wrong guy. Players like Art Donovan could find something funny in a broken leg. They were undeniably violent, certifiably tough. I lost six teeth on one play when I blocked the punt. He kicked me in the teeth and uh, knocked all my teeth out. And I vividly remember that because I was looking on the ground for my teeth. And, when I'm, and everyone was yelling, get in the huddle, Bob. You know, it wasn't get off the field, Bob. You know, get in the huddle. We, we, we don't want to call a timeout. Number 79, Bob St. Clair of the 49ers had a caveman aura, but he was no brainless brute. At six foot nine, 270 pounds, he was a massive blocking machine. St. Clair credited his great strength to eating raw meat, an eccentricity which earned him the nickname, the geek. We used to go out and shoot doves, and it was all illegal, you know, in season and so forth. And, uh, I would, would take the, the doves, and uh, I remember one day, we had, I had about 12, uh, you know, maybe more than that, uh, 12, 15 doves. And we were plucking them and cleaning them, and I would take the heart, you know, and I was making a little pile of dove hearts over here in the corner. And then 
this this uh, kid from Nebraska came Omaha and came over and said, uh, "What are you doing with that pile of hearts?" And I said, "Why, well, I'm going to eat them. That's why I put them over there." And he said, "What are you going to have? Make some kind of a sauce?" I said, "Sauce? No, no, no. These are real good. This way here. You see these?" And I, I put two in my mouth and was chewing on them and looking at them. And I thought he, was, he turned three different colors. I thought he was going to faint right there. He ran out of there. I'm sure that he would call back to his girlfriend or his wife or his mother or something in, in Omaha and say, there are cannibals out here. The 1950s produced the most outlandish cast of characters in pro football history, a witch's brew of monsters, mavericks, and magicians. The most colorful team in the league was the Detroit Lions, a riotous bunch of revelers who loved wine, women, and song. Their party shaper was quarterback Bobby Lay. One time we passed him at halftime, coming out for the second half in Baltimore. I said, Bobby, how you doing? He breathed on me. I said, Jesus, is that from last night? He said, I had a couple at halftime. So, you know, he was a character, but a great football player, tough guy. Mm -hmm. 